Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. So we are live on uh, YouTube, Facebook, and uh, Instagram. So Shabaka will join me in a few minutes on Instagram too. Okay, now, how do I, oh, here we go. Did you find it? Yeah, I sent yeah. you a request. Okay, yeah, got it. Okay, so thank you for tuning in. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us, Shabaka. It's a, a pleasure. real pleasure to have you. Yeah. I'm just turning on my volume on the, on the Instagram. Yeah, yeah, me too. <laughs> it's okay now. Uh, yeah, thank you for being here. It's a, it's a real pleasure. Like uh, I remember last time we met, it was like two years ago, maybe it was in a festival in Paris, but yeah. uh, it seems so far away now. Yeah, but back when we could actually do gigs, it was um, uh, kind of, uh, in retrospect, it was quite a special time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it was a uh, yeah, it was a nice show. Like I, I really like that festival uh, at La Villette uh, during summer. It's a, it's a nice one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I have a, a few questions for you. Um, so yeah, first I was um, the, your band Sons of Kemet, uh, for which you compose every tune as a unconventional lineup no it's not uh, often that you see like a saxophone a tuba and two drummers in the same uh, in the same band so how how did you come up with that idea how did you create the the band um actually it's good that you asked me this because I've, I've been going through my old notes recently um because i'm writing a book at the moment oh, nice. um a, a kind of called letters to a young musician um and it's basically just writing as if i'm writing all the thoughts um, that I have about music to someone who's younger than myself and wants to just know how to kind of, you know, what what kind of path I've been through. So I, I came across a book that I uh, was writing notes to myself in about 10 years ago when I started Sunday Kemet. Um, and it really just emphasized to me that I was, it was just a process of experimentation. You know, there were, at the time I was doing a lot of free improvisation. Um, so that was where my head was at. It was about combinations of musicians and actually how different musicians have various personalities that I can like kind of spark off and get inspiration from. Um, it wasn't about the, the instrumentation per se. It was just about, you know, I, I wanted to see what happened when the musicianship of Tom Skinner, Seb Rochford, you know, collided. And when Oren Marshall, who was the original tuba player, when he was added to the mix, um, and I had various different combinations that I wrote in this book. Um, and, and that was the first one that I, I chose. Um, and it worked, so I just continued to do it. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you, you studied the classical clarinet in, uh, in London uh, before moving to jazz. So how did you switch from classical to jazz music? Um, I wouldn't normally call it a switch. It was just <laughs> okay. a, maybe a, a change in focus at some point. So when I started the classical course, the my aim wasn't to necessarily be a classical musician. It was to try to to incorporate the the kind of legacy of teaching that that institution had in it. So you know, I remember having a conversation with Courtney Pine when I was, you know, um, 18 and thinking about going to music college and I was and I was asking him, do you think I should do classical, the classical course or the jazz course? And he was saying, you know, you just need to pick whichever course has the longest legacy of training for the instrument that you want to play. So if you want to play the saxophone, the jazz course probably has the longest legacy of the type of music that you want to play. Whereas the clarinet is quite a specific thing. It's like, you've got a very long tradition of the teaching of the clarinets and different methods and different um, techniques of playing it that are kind of only accessible in the classical course because they're just not, not that many classical, I mean, um, jazz teachers of the clarinet. So he was saying, if you want to be serious about the clarinet as an instrument, then you probably should do the classical course because then you'll just get the best training. Um, so yeah, I went into the course more 
more not to be a classical musician, but to get the the knowledge and the the kind of technical training and facility that the, the classical musicians had. Um, and you know, for me, it was it's all the kind of the same thing in that if you're playing a classical concert, you might have to do like Brahms in as one piece. You might have to do a, a piece of Stravinsky. You might have to do like a Horowitz something. And all of these different composers that you're playing might have, you know, come from different epochs. You know, they might have different um, emotional needs that need to be applied for the type of, you know, the specific type of music that they play. Because classical music isn't one homogenous form. You know, it's you've got to play um, a Bach etude very differently to how you play uh, a piece by Morton Feldman or a piece by, you know, Stravinsky, etc. So for me the the ideal you know like way that you perform these classical pieces is to try to be at the the mercy of the composer so you're trying to get into the the mindset of the specific music that you're playing it's not like you play classical music so you play it in a certain way it's more like you play classical music so you allow yourself to be uh, a conduit or you allow yourself to be a medium of the expression that a composer is trying to put forward uh, for whatever particular age they come from. So for me, jazz is kind of of the same thing in that when I was learning jazz, it's not that I'm learning like a thing called jazz. I, I would say I want to learn about, you know, a specific era. You know, I might want to learn a bit about bebop or at some point I might be really into Coltrane or I might be really trying to learn specific skills associated with certain types of music associated with jazz um and it it was just about especially in that period when i was in music college it was just about learning as much as music in general as, as i could and then at some point it all comes together and you know i decided to ignore some things that i've learned and emphasize others you know okay and um so you also play saxophone. So uh, what's the place of the clarinet uh, with the saxophone? What does the clarinet? Uh, what place does the clarinet hold in your heart, and uh, and why, in comparison with the saxophone? Mm, well, it's, that's a it's a it's an interesting question actually, um, because since the kind of pandemic has started, the clarinet has actually regained focus. Um, in my life because that's the main instrument that I am that I'm practicing when I am practicing it um, simply because I like the sound of the clarinet in small spaces more than the saxophone you know so at the moment um, especially being in lockdown and not seeing anyone it's about how I feel um, while playing and actually I really like the intimate the intimacy that you have from the clarinet sound um, so that feeling like you're playing for yourself and within a contained environment. Uh, and that's at the moment what the client has given me. But in a broader sense, if you're looking at this, you know, my life in music and what the, what place the clarinet has had in relation to the sax, um, the clarinet is the instrument that I started with. So the clarinet's actually, you know, if I think what is my instrument, I would say my instrument is the clarinet, whereas the saxophone is the instrument that I think I've always wanted to play since I was young. But I, I started on the clarinet because it was the instrument I was given and that's what I trained on. Um, the saxophone has its benefits in that it's louder, you know, and by louder, it's not, it's not to say that the clarinet cannot be loud, but there's a certain way of playing the clarinet to project it in a loud manner that happens easy, more easily when you're playing a saxophone because it's a bigger, you know, it's got a bigger bore and it's metal as opposed to wood. Um, you know, with the type of music that I play and the, the type of effect that I want to have um, with my personality in conjunction with the music, the saxophone for a number of years has been the main um, the main tool, just because I, I like that strength that the instrument has, especially the tenor saxophone. Um, it feels like I can blow as much as my physical body can give with the saxophone and I can get an equivalent kind of reply outwards. Uh, whereas the clarinet, it's a, it's a different personality, um, which I love. Um, but, you know, if you've got two drummers smashing away behind you, you know, a, a clarinet isn't really going to, you're, you're going to have to really put a lot of energy in the clarinet to get it to sound the way it needs to. 
Um, and this is one of my big kind of issues with um, the clarinet versus the sax in, in performance. If you try to make the clarinet um, match that level of dynamic sound, either the sound is going to get um, disrupted in that you're going to be overblowing and the sound becomes shrill. And I, I, I hate nothing more than a shrill clarinet sound. It really gets to me. Um, or you're not going to be heard. Um, maybe there's stuff to do with miking, but I've not really investigated kind of complex miking of the clarinet. I just put a mic on the top of it and just see what happens. Um, but yeah, that's, you know, the clarinet and the sax. It's, it's, it's all functional at the moment. It's like, if I write pieces specifically for clarinet, then I, I play it. Or if they're pieces that I, I think, you know, the clarinet suits it. But for the bands, you know, for the regular band and touring work, it's just the saxophone. Uh, while I was on the road um, for the last, you know, pr prior to 2020, um, it was mainly the sax also because in the realities of, of touring and like setting up and having to, to kind of quickly sound check, it's just easier to have one instrument, you know. And, you know, I don't think I'm lazy, but there definitely is a kind of element of convenience that I like in only having to put together one instrument and focus on getting the sound right for one particular voice. Um, so I decided that would be the saxophone. And if I brought in the clarinet, it would just be sometimes too complicated if you just need to turn up at a festival and, you know, have a very, very quick sound check and play. Um, I didn't want to have to like go, oh no, you know, the client is not sounding good or the, the saxophone is too low, you know. I just want to have one thing to focus on and then that's that's it. Okay, so um, is it something you were uh, investigating when we designed um, the clarinet mouse piece? So you wanted to get more power? What what was your request on your uh, um, Sayo's bass? Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so the bass clarinet was interesting. Uh, it's, I've always had an issue with the bass clarinet mouthpieces in that I, I've always felt that, well, even more than the B-flat clarinet, I hate to hear um, bass clarinet sounds that sound like they're overblown just to get a basic sound. And that doesn't mean that I don't like to hear overblown bass clarinet. I, I love to hear overblown bass clarinet. But I, I like the feeling that you can get a very powerful sound in the bass clarinet and then take it into the extremities, as opposed to having, if you're going to play with a live band, having to overblow just to get a basic sound out the instrument. So my, 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 my kind of trouble throughout the years has been, with, with most mouthpieces that I've tried on that instrument, has been that if I'm going to actually play with a band, I've got to blow so hard to actually get the frequency of the instrument above the drums and the bass that it feels like I'm overblowing and I've got nowhere to go. So the main, the first thing was that I, I wanted a mouthpiece that projects a lot, but then it holds the core darkness of its sound when it's playing being played really, loud, really loudly. Um, but... I, you know, another thing that I, I, I don't prefer is having to change the mouthpieces to different settings. So even though I want a mouthpiece that can play loudly enough to be played with a live band, you know, in full steam, I wanted a mouthpiece that if I'm playing uh, a quiet piece in a room by myself or to a small audience, that can, it all also has a kind of woody quality to it that I like, you know. Because um, I, I like the sound of the instrument, you know, I like I like the instrument to sound like like itself. I don't want it to sound okay when you're playing, you know, really loudly. But then when you're playing quietly, it sounds like something other than what it is, which is a, a long piece of wood, you know. Okay, uh, um, we have a, we have a question from Instagram. So how many instruments does Shabaka play and which one is your favorite to play? And which one is your favorite to hear? Mm. Um, well, I, play, I would say I play the clarinet and saxophone. So I, I own a few clarinet, B-flat clarinets. Um, I own a couple of bass clarinets. Um, uh, and then tenor saxophone, I've got a soprano. And I've recently been given an alto um, from a friend whose dad was a, a professional musician in the 30s um, and had a really, really great boucher, kind of old saxophone. Um, and then I play kind of flutes that I've collected, you know, throughout the years. 
uh, from various places. So I've got a, a sakurahachi flute from Japan and a number of plastic sakurahachis um, that I practice on. And then a, a kind of wooden flute from Martinique, um, another wooden one that I got in Swaziland. Uh, and then this little kind of instruments that I pick up. Um, but in general, I would say I play um, the clarinet and saxophone. Um, but the favorite one to hear, um, it's a tough question. I, I would say if, that my initial answer would just be the clarinet because the clarinet is my like, natural instrument. You know, the clarinet is the instrument that I got excited with when I was a, a youngster first. You know, and for instance, Don Byron was my initial hero of the clarinet. Like he was my, you know, reason for wanting to um, push what I thought the clarinet could be. Um, so I love his sound, you know, also on the clarinet, for instance, Chris Speed. Um, I really like his sound as well. He was a big inspiration. Um, and then older players like Jimmy Hamilton or Barney Bigard, I like their sounds also. And like Tony, Tony Cole um, was a great clarinet player also. And Tony Scott. Okay, uh, it seems that, that there is some echo on my voice, so I'm wondering if it's your uh, phone. Can you just see if the sound is turned off? Uh, that's the lowest that I can take it on the Instagram live. Uh, yeah, me phone, too. So, yeah, I don't want. I don't know what's uh, happening because usually I don't get some echo on on if Instagram. I turn you down on here. How is it now? Uh, I don't know, people, is it better? It seems better, no? I don't know. Let's see. Uh, I have a question from Clarinet Cola. Shabaka, I love your sound. What's your mouthpiece setup? Well, on the bass clarinet, it's my uh, signature SY or S mouthpiece. On the, the B flat clarinet, it's, I'm actually, in, in developing uh, uh, an SY clarinet, an SY or S mouthpiece for the B flat one, um, but at the moment, well, kind of traditionally, I, I, I play B forty fives, Van Doren's, um, and that's what I played. For instance, when I did a, the Copeland Concerto in last in December um, or November, I can't remember now. Um, but really, at the moment, I've gone actually to a B forty. Um, and I like the, the closeness of the sound um, just because I'm playing by myself so much in, in a small room. Um, on the tenor, I play a Morgan Fry mouthpiece, um, quite an open one, like a 10 star, uh, but with a soft read, like a, a kind of too soft um, Rico Jazz Select. Okay. Um, in, in terms of the, oh yeah, the bass clarinet opening, it's just a medium, uh, medium sized mouthpiece with a kind of uh, maybe like the two and a half Van Doren read, um, so not a very hard setup. And the same with the clarinet, I was telling um, you, you know, just um, before we kind of started filming, um, I I feel like I've gone down sizes since the start of the pandemic because playing in my, you know, playing in my house so much, I don't have to project. And actually, I don't, I don't need to project. And I started to appreciate how quietly I can play. So one of the, the things I've been practicing for, I've been wanting to practice it for many years, but I've never really gotten around to it. And now it's been the perfect time was to see just how quietly I can get. And it's a thing I knew about this technique in theory, but it's only recently that I've actually started to really like dedicate myself to playing quietly. And the whole principle is um, trying to get that first initial sound that the instrument makes, the, the point where it goes from breath to sound, you know, like you've just got air blowing through the instrument and that point where that breath turns to the very first sound that the instrument makes, you know, and trying to hold that first sound as a long note and mm -hmm. then move up to another note, maybe another step up and then another step up, but without increasing the volume until you can basically play anything, your whole etude or whatever, but on the quietest volume you can. And I've gone into the stage now, it's like at the start of the pandemic, I couldn't do it, you know, I was just squeaking all the, you know, not squeaking, but I was having notes come out, pop out and, you know, not having the control to do it. But now I can practice at any time of the day, you know, like now I can practice at three in the morning and I've got, I just live in a flat, so I've got neighbours on the sides of me, I've got neighbours up or below, but no one knows that I practice, you know, the people that know I, I play, they just go, we never hear you practice. And I go, I practice all the time, you know, like even the saxophone, I started to do it, um, but I practice so quietly 
that no one can ever hear me. Um, and for me, it's a matter of getting that technique so that you're blowing the same amount of air that you would play if you're playing loudly, but you're just having a really, really minuscule volume. Um, and this is one of the lessons that you know I got when I was in the classical course, because the whole thing was that um, the technique of playing loudly or quietly is the same. It's just a matter of the, the pressure, uh, internal pressure. So my one of the, the issues that I had to resolve when I was in college that actually I'm only resolving now was that when I played quietly, my my air pressure went down and I was doing less support. But the whole thing is if you can support the airflow properly when you're playing at a quiet dynamic, it means that your technique and the whole way that your mouth you set up and everything is is in gear and actually when you play loudly the whole kind of flow of air and the, the control and technique is going to be even better so i find that when i can play very very quietly and, and hold those tones um, at a quiet dynamic when it comes to playing loudly it's um it's even louder basically uh, and with even more control so that's interesting uh so we have a question from sarati how did you come up with that insane riff in blood of the past um with all of our our tunes with the comments coming um we we start by by improvising so we get into the studio we, we book the studio for like three or four days and we just play for the whole time maybe if there's a tune where you think okay you know this is sounding like you know a tune you might kind of stop and do it again. But in general, everything that you hear on the album is is parts of very long form improvisations that are then edited and produced to make um, to make um, concise tunes. So with something like Blood of the Past, it's just that in the heat of a, a particularly good improvisation, this came up with a riff. Uh, and it's a, it's a particular way of improvising. It's like improvising knowing that you're not trying necessarily to um, experiment sonically, but you're trying to improvise melodies, you know? So it's me going, I'm trying to listen as much as possible to the others in the band and see what melodic material comes into my head instantly. And can I um, articulate that on the spur of the moment um, in a very coherent way? You know, and for me, that's the key to improvisation, coherency. You know, it doesn't matter if it's abstract or, or not. It's like, is the idea coherent? So if I if Dan is playing a riff and I hear that bum, da 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 bum, it's about going, can I just play that exactly how it's in my head in a split second, you know? And that's the way that sometimes I'll practice. I'll just try to kind of go, what do I hear? And, you know, like try to almost like sing a melody in my head and just play instantly with no, with no um, hesitation. Um, and that, yeah, I mean, it, you know, that, that's kind of all it is. It's, you know, for me, it's like if you can sing something and your instrument is an extension of your voice, you should be able to just kind of play it instantly. Um, I've got perfect relative pitch. Um, so if I kind of go, Dun, I would be able to go for instance. Uh, 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 kind of nearly there, it's off by semitone. But in general, if I kind of sing a, a phrase, I can just kind of play it instantly on the instrument, just because I know what each note sounds like on the horn. Um, which makes it easier, you know. Yeah. Uh, so we have a question from Jake. Hi, what's he, what is, in your opinion, the best way to practice long tones and for how long? Um, that's a great question. Um, I am, I'm still battling with long tones. You know, it's really, it's, it's an uphill battle. Uh, and I remember there's a Steve Lacey interview where he's talking about the playing of long tones. And he says that there's a special area where you play a long tone for like three hours, you know, and you play, you know, you play however you want. You just you can play in, you know, loudly quietly however but you basically just play these long tones for three hours after the first hour you start getting bored after the second hour you start to feel like you're going insane and by the third hour you start to break into actually the harmonics structure of the note that you're playing and really hear 
how the note is set up, especially if it's a note on the bottom of the horn, like the sax, for instance. Um, I've never been able to do that. I've never even been able to play long tones for more than 20 minutes. You know, mm -hmm. it's really a concentration thing. It's like I always start and then I just get distracted and I, I go on to something else, you know. Um, but for me, it's like as long as I try to play in a, a way of playing long tones. So it might be that I, I put on a record and I play along to it, but using long, consistent notes. Or it might be that as a, as a consistent warm up, I, I put on a metronome and I play each note for eight beats. Uh, I remember actually when I was studying, um, my practice routine um, before I was start kind of playing every day would be, um, yeah, this thing where I put the metronome on and play each note in the chromatic scale for eight beats. So it might be like, uh, so on and so forth, all the way at the instrument. And then I play that at just a kind of medium dynamic. And then I might play it at a quiet dynamic. And then I might play it at a loud dynamic. And then I might play it um, going up in volume for four beats and going down in volume for four beats for each note. Um, and that'll take you probably about half an hour to do. I don't do that anymore. And actually I probably should do it because it's a good way of playing long notes. Um, but in general, these days I, I just, warm up by playing in a in a long toned way um but especially in this kind of climate where um you're just at home playing to yourself and for yourself i get bored really easily and what i practice has to be exciting i, I feel like i don't have the patience to do something that's dry and technical like just play you know bah you know, for ages. So I'll just put on a record. Um, and at the moment, it's this record here. Um, well, I've got two. This one, which is, um, is the Royal, the, the Ezinui Royal Drummers. I, I kind of put on this record, or Blessing by um, Collington um, Ayinla, which is a kind of um, Fuji uh, Nigerian music. Um, and I just play along to it. Um, and I find it's good in that it, it gives your brain something to concentrate on while you're just playing long tones. Or it might be that I just kind of practice pentatonic scales um, slowly um, to, along with the records. Um, and, you know, having drumming records with no harmony is great because it means that you can then practice in all keys um, without it sounding like it's clashing. Okay, interesting. Um, so Esteban is asking, what are your influences on your effects as the setup, especially with Comet's coming band? Um, really, you know, my, my, I, I would say that I'm not really an effects kind of guy. Um, uh, there's a lot of people that play a lot more effects than I do. Um, traditionally I only play the, the memory man basically. And my influence on that is Pete Rerum. Um, who used to lead the band Acoustic Ladyland and now leads the band Melt Yourself Down. And he used to also play in Polar Bear. Um, and he used to play the Memory Man and I loved how he's played. So I just started playing the Memory Man too. Uh, the same with the Mike in the Bell, you know. He played the Mike in the Bell. I like the sound. So I was like, yeah, cool. I'll, I'll do that also, you know. Um, and it's for me, it's just about having a basic um, delayed delay sound, almost like how a kind of dub dub singer would have um whereas i know there are people that use effects a lot more and actually use the effect to alter what the sax is doing for me it's just about having a bit of depth to the sound of the saxophone in terms of sonic sonic depth um at the moment i i don't play a memory man i play a cast um a strymon caspian um which is the same thing as like a kind of tape echo delay um pedal um but it's always just one um, and I just use it on, a, I normally just have a basic couple of settings I use. I use one where I do a basic slap back uh, where the uh, delays quite quick and one where the delays at medium and one where the delays really wild and long. Uh, and that's it. Um, just because I, I, I don't like the idea of the technology um, getting in the way of my ideas. I want to just have a few parameters with the technology. I, you know, press a button or flick a switch and then I get on to focusing on the music or the saxophone. You know. But um, that's not 
you know, I'm not saying that in terms of like one shouldn't use effects, you know, do whatever you want, you know, um, that's just me, you know, personally. Uh, so we have a question from Arlot. Are you still into hip hop and what do you think of the US and UK beat scene? Yeah, I mean, hip hop's great. I mean, like, it's just about artists that are good or that I find not good, I, artists that I find interesting or not, you know? Um, so yeah, I listen to, I, I just listen to loads of stuff. I mean, the last hip hop record I think I listened to was the Benny the Butcher album. Uh, this was really great, uh, like the production, like the, the way he raps. Um, I listened to the kind of the, the, the Rick Ross tiny desk session this morning, actually. This is really funny, the background singers. Um, but yeah, the U US and UK beat scene, um, I like them. I mean, I, I feel like there's a place that hip hop or like the beat scene can go in terms of incorporating um, traditional rhythms and sounds into the beats which some you know i have heard done but i feel like it you know it's it's an area of exploration that you know just from what i've heard isn't necessarily emphasized as much as i would like it to be um but you know hopefully this is remedied but yeah i just you know if music's good i'm into it you know okay uh, how did you develop your sound i think you have an amazing tone say black hair well um it's been a it's been a journey, you know. Like for a long time, I didn't, you know. I, I remember when I was in college, um, the the paradigm was more woody and warm sounds. So everyone was listening to Mark Turner, Joe Lovano, um, mm -hmm. Chris Cheek, um, same as Blake, and that was the kind of space that our heads was at in terms of trying to get a darker, warmer, woodier sound. Um, and I love their sounds and I, I still love them, but it's like my, my concept of what I want to sound like has really shifted over the years. It's like I started to then get into like Albert Isler and actually find that I am interested in, in a brighter sound, you know. And actually, I would say the Coltrane sound is pretty bright. You know, I, I know there's this kind of conversation on yeah. whether Coltrane has a dark or bright sound. But actually, when you really listen as if you're in the room, it sounds pretty it sounded pretty piercing. Um, and that's what you would get if you play a small mouthpiece, which he played, I think he played like a five star or something, or maybe a six toward the end of his career um, with a hard read. But if you play that setup, your sound is gonna be kind of very direct and biting. Um, so then if you listen in that way, you can see the connection between his sound and then Sonny Rollins sound, who also, I've, you know, from, from my ears, has quite a bright sound, but it's like it's bright in itself, but then the way it resonates in the room is is, is with a darkness. That's the best mm -hmm. way I can describe it. Um, yes, and I got I got into like trying to see the darkness in bright sounds, if that makes any sense, mm -hmm. um, and trying to get into that, you know. So yeah, it's my my sound concept has changed, and I remember there's a big period where I didn't like my sound at all because I kind of thought that the woody and darker sounds were better. And that my kind of bright sound was, was horrible, you know. Um, and then, you know, over the years, getting used to how I sound, you know, I'm realizing actually how you sound is how you sound. It's like not liking the sound of your voice. It's like, you know, it's not going to change. It's just going to make you depressed, <laughs> you know. So the, the quicker you can get used to it, then the more you can start developing what is, as opposed to trying to make it into something that it is not, you know. The same someone like Ornette Coleman, it's like he's got his sound because he believed in how he sounded from early on and tried to emphasize that way of playing. Um, yeah, and it's, you know, that for me, it's like the sound is a very personal thing. It's like you can try to emulate other players and, and actually um, explore their setups and their way of blowing and the way of putting their instruments into their mouth to sound like them. But at the end of the, at the, end of the day, it's like, the, the sound that happens when you pick the instrument up and you kind of play it, you know, what your specific body type is going towards, you know, that's for me what, what you should be trying to figure out, you know, like, you know, it took me a lot of years to figure out what sound my body was trying to just push me towards. And actually, you know, like sometimes I hear my sound on like just dry monitor mixes, like on recordings, and it's so kind of piercing and bright. I'm just like, Jesus, I can't, you know, <laughs> you know, but, you know, obviously, it, you know, 
what you hear on the other side of the concert hall or what you hear on the other side of the, the, the record or the CD is a different thing to what a player is, what happens on the, you know, on the side of the player. Like I think my, my sound is pretty bright uh, and piercing, but it's, it's always played in a context where that's appropriate. Um, and this is one of the things that I like about, you know, that I want from the mouthpieces that I play. I want to be able to then rein that in when I have to. So for instance, on the last track of the, the last Shabak and Ancestors album, um, I think it's called Teach Me To Be Vulnerable. Um, it's just a duet with me and the piano. Uh, and I'm playing pretty, you know, like subtoned and it's a quite a kind of warm sound, um, which is quite a long way off the sound from say the first track where I'm kind of playing really hard and the sound is really bright. Mm -hmm. And for me, that's what I want in a mouthpiece, that ability to, at one point, cut, be able to cut across, you know, the band really kind of cooking and, and playing really wildly and then being able to rein it in and play really softly and soft, subtoned. You know. Okay. So we have a question from Instagram. So did you write or play all the 808 drums on the upcoming albums? 808 drums um you might be referring to the comics coming album i did a there's no there's no 808 drums on the Kemet album um but we just recorded like just before this last lockdown in Mon in england we just recorded a comics coming album and max had a drum machine and i i did kind of some programming for one for one tune um it might have been an 808 actually yeah um, but no, not all the drum, uh, the 808 drums, just on one tune. Okay. Um, what is the problem to play in small formation with a non-common formation like Sons of Kemet? I guess what's, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, the big, the big issue with Sons of Kemet is just the, the level of volume that happens when two drummers are going for it. So it's like for all best intentions, like, you know, sometimes I'll tell them, look guys, it's a small club, you know, I can't, I've only got like one monitor, for instance, I can't play above a certain dynamic because it's just not possible for me. And they go, yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, no, we understand Shabaka. Yeah, yeah, that's fine, yeah. And then the spirit hits them in the moment. And all of a sudden I look back and like someone's hands are in the air like this and they're just bashing their drums as hard as they can. And I go, what am I supposed to do? So that's the main problem. It's like, you know, when things get heated, it gets really loud. And then that gets the, the kind of other problem of feedback in the monitors. So mm -hmm. the louder the drums are, the, the loud, the more I need to hear myself. Um, just because I am quite kind of specific about what I'm doing. You know, I, it's not, I, I feel like I, I didn't used to be, it used to be just, blow as hard as I can and see if I survive to the end of the gig. But now I, I kind of like to just be, I like to be able to hear actually what I'm doing and still craft some some poetry as I'm doing it. Um, so if I'm getting myself to the level whereby I can actually hear myself when the drums are really raging and going hard, then it means that I'll probably be in that region where feedback's gonna come from my mic because it's in the bell. So that's always the big kind of payoff what's the level that my monitor is going to be um, before it starts the feedback, considering that the drum is going to play so loud. We used mm -hmm. to have that problem in the comment is coming because um, Dan, Dan who plays the synth is so loud. Like there was a point where he was so loud. I had no synth in my monitor whatsoever. <laughs> um, I was getting all my synth from his side of the stage. He'd have wow. like a stack of amps behind him and a stack of and amps on either side of him and he was blazing his ears into smithereens and actually me as well. Um, so then I would only have saxophone and bass drum for the Comet. Um, for the last year of touring before 2020, uh, we got in-air monitors and that kind of solved that whole problem. So now I can actually have a really balanced mix and it took a while to get used to it. Um, I kind of thought about it a lot and I agreed with the principle of it and decided I'm gonna stick with it because I, I like the idea of being able to um, 
have a perfect balance in my head, even though there's some level of the live vibration that you get back from the sound that you lose within your monitors. It means that I can actually hear as if I'm in a studio. Um, and then for instance, like when we were touring the UK with a comet, we toured with our own uh, mixing desk, which meant that actually our monitor mixes were the same every night. You know, we didn't, we didn't have to rely on the, the PA. The PA was just for the audience. Um, so it meant that actually we didn't even need to sound check. We did sound check, obviously, but the sound that we were getting in our ears was the same every night. And then it means that you can go to another level of musicality mm. when you actually know what you're going to hear. You know, you, you put in your, your earplugs and the sound that you're getting is, is perfect. You know, it's like, you know, you know what it's going to be. There's no surprises if the crowd is big or small then you can actually focus in and start to um, just concentrate on the music, not be thinking, I wish that guy would just turn down already, you know? Yeah. Okay. Uh, do we have... So we have a, another question on Instagram. What was your experience playing with Roscoe Mitchell? Yeah, it was great. No, um... <laughs> It, you know, the art ensemble in Chicago, it, um, I'm trying to think what I felt. You know, the, the first thing is like, when you're playing next to Roscoe, you can like see him listening, you know? Like I, I'm looking around and anyone is playing, um, like a solo or any more what's happening, and his head is down and he's rocking and he's just listening. And like, he's, it's like he's involved, he's listening and swaying, he's, he's involved in the, the flow of the energy of the music. You know, which is really, you know, it's great to see and it's great to also remember that that is what it's about. You know, it's about being in the energy of the music, whether you're playing or not. You know, that's like the big lesson I, I kind of got from that. It's like, you know, when the instrument leaves your mouth, you're not disconnected from what is happening with the kind of trajectory of the set or the way the music is going. Um, it's all one thing. Um, also, um, yeah, he's just such an amazing player. And it feels like he's got an experimental approach or not an experimental, he's got um, a living approach to whatever instrument he takes up. And by living, it means that he's trying to, to find like a sense of vitality and a sense of life in, in everything that he plays. You know, he's not playing for the purpose of displaying technique or relaying you know some kind of historical precedent he's playing to express the fact that he is alive and living and interested in exploring you know possibilities okay um you came up with a very specific vision of your uh, engravings on the on the bass clarinet mouthpiece and especially about the ang design of your ligatures do you have it here just to show people oh, yeah. So yeah, this is um I said I'll show it for the YouTube first and then the Instagram because I've got two cameras actually. So I'll show yeah. <laughs> now I'll show it on the Instagram. Uh, so yeah, here it is. Now show it off the YouTube. So, yeah, what's the whole philosophy behind it? Can you tell us a little more about that? Yeah, so it's basically, you know, I, I, I was listening to this documentary a while ago and it was talking about Native American um, ceremony, um, smoking ceremonies. Well, not smoking ceremonies, but ceremonies where they smoke. Um, mm -hmm. And saying that a lot of times they'll have their spirit animal carved into the wood um, so that when they light up the pipe, they're staring into the eyes of the animal that they connect with. And they can, in that moment of being intoxicated with whatever they're smoking, the thing that is, you know, reverberating in their consciousness is the ideas associated with the animal directly, you know? And it's like, we, our thoughts are associated with what we see, you know, unless we are at a very deep level of, of meditation. It's like, if you see something, your thoughts are, you know, that encompasses your thoughts. So it's like, if I'm playing, what is the first thing that that um, that hits my vision? Normally, if I'm playing on stage with a saxophone, either my eyes are shut or I'm looking at the crook of the saxophone, 
you know, and that is it. Or I'm, I'm looking at my bandmates in a kind of um, hazy way, <laughs> you know, um, because it's, I don't know, I, I don't like to be distracted um, and I'm not easily distracted, uh, but I like to be able to focus my gaze. Occasionally I'll look at the audience, but it'll be a kind of flash and I'm taking a lot of stuff that's happening all at once. Um, but I'm very interested in actually what I decide to, to look at and what I decide to think about. Um, and, you know, I've been doing a lot of research on, on the ANC and actually what it means. Um, it's, it's very, very deep, you know, I kind of can't go, in, if I were to go into it, it, I can only go into it on like stage one, where there's like lots of different stages and what it means. But essentially, when I'm playing, especially for myself, but in public, I want to be concerned with the ideas associated with the ANC. You know, and it's the same thing essentially with like crystals, uh, for instance, like I carry around, for instance, uh, and like for instance, uh, amethyst crystal, um, not because I think the object itself gives anything in particular, but it makes me think of intuition. You know, I associate this object with the fact of intuition. So whenever I see it, the word intuition comes into my head and I'm more aware of the fact of intuition being a driving force in what I'm trying to do. Whereas if I didn't have the crystal, it might be that I was really stressed out about something or the other. And I'm thinking about like, I don't know, doing my tax on time or, you know, <laughs> how stinky my clothes are because I'm on tour, you know, or something like that. You know, whereas I look at the crystal, I think, no, what I'm interested in is intuition, you know, and it just focuses my mind on what I think about. So that was the basic thing with the ant. It's almost like saying, the world of um, objects, the world of external objects is, is basically vying for your attention. You know, social media, for instance, being the chief, um, the chief agent in, in vying for our attention. It's like saying, look at me, look at me, look at me. Whereas <laughs> trying to get objects that you can say, I am going to dedicate my attention and my focus to this object at this particular time. You know, so when I'm engaging with my instrument, I just want to be thinking deep thoughts about the ank and intuition and spirituality. And then when I put down the instrument, I might think about things like, you know, just other stuff, you know. <laughs> but they, for me, it's like good to just have um, reminders of what I want to be um, thinking about, uh, where I want my thoughts to be directed in the moment of playing. Okay, so did him. Um... Did you change uh, your way of playing since you, you got that special ligature? Um, not to, I think I always used to, I always generally look downwards. Um, it went in, my, in terms of my focus of vision, but it's meant that I definitely, it's like I try to look through the hoop. As you can see, there's a, it's like a kind of cross with a, a, a circular hoop on top of it. So it means that when I'm playing, especially if I'm kind of solo, um, I'm just trying to look through that um, that hoop. Just that's that's it. Just look at it and not think actively, but have thoughts associated with that coming to my head. Interesting. Uh, also, it's a great ligature, so you know I enjoy it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how how do you get into circular breath? and uh, how to improve it? Um, it's, it's, it's really just a matter of, of practice, I think, you know, like I, I think there was no real um, landmark moment where I learned how to do it properly. It's something that I remember being interested in when I was in high school and people trying to do it and like, experimenting. And it's just been a matter of experimentation throughout the years. Um, knowing the principle of it obviously helps, uh, and then just doing it until you understand how your body operates. And the principle is pretty simple. The principle is that you can't breathe in through your nose while blowing out through your lungs because it's just not physiologically possible to do that. So while playing, there's going to be a moment where you stop blowing out from your lungs and you push air out through the corners of your mouth. While you push that air out through your, your cheeks, you take a quick breath in through your nose. So you know, and then you keep blowing. And then while you blow, you basically allow air to fill up in your cheeks. So. You know, 
and it goes on and on like that. So in that moment that you squeeze the air from your cheeks, you just take a quick breath in through your nose and then go. In terms of the physiological aspect of it, if you don't, it's always a battle between the carbon dioxide that gets built up in your body as kind of internal pressure. So you've got to actually blow the air through the instrument um, so that that air that's stored up doesn't kind of get stored up too much. Um, one of the problems that I used to have beginning to circular breathe is that it felt like I was going to burst after a while um, just because there wasn't actually a circular, you know, obviously a circular approach to breathing. It has to be that the air comes in, but you actually blow it out enough to be empty. And then you kind of take a quick breath in, you know. So it's like that, you know. And, you know, sometimes I'll, I just now I'm blowing out through my nose also, just so that I can actually release some of the pressure um, so that then I can take in. But it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of like a simple premise. It's just, you know, as you're blowing, you allow your air, your cheeks to fill up with air, and then you, you squeeze your, your cheeks together. And in that moment that you squeeze, you breathe in quickly through your nose, and then you just keep going. And yeah, it's, you know, the main issue that, that I kind of think about um, at this stage, now that I've got the technique right, is just relaxation. Because mm. the, the tendency is after you've been circular breathing for a while, to start tensing up, especially the right hand. So it's just about actually really keeping relaxed. And for me, it's like the, the relaxation comes from two points. It comes from the elbow, uh, which might seem strange, and it comes from this part of the, the kind of wrist. The elbow, just because I found it might be, um, what's the word? Um, can't think of the word, but it might be something that I've imagined. But if I imagine my elbow to be loose, it kind of relaxes a whole area Mm -hmm. all from my kind of shoulders to my to my wrist whereas i find that if i'm tense my i find that my elbows are are yeah. kind of clenched so if i if i kind of feel like i've relaxed this part of my body uh and i'm just kind of actually i'll put on my finger you can see what i mean if i'm kind of just relaxing my elbows like this it feels good also if this area the wrist is stuck like this or stuck like that then that's no good when you're circular breathing because that tension is gonna is gonna get you. It's gonna turn into tendonitis or RSI. Um, mm. So what you've got to do is basically you have that joint be completely straight, you know, so that when you're circular breathing, um, this air the, the tendons here don't lock, don't stick in an uncomfortable position. So I'm just trying to keep my technique as like solid as possible. And so on and so forth. Okay. Yeah, now we need we need to practice. <laughs> uh, so we have another question from Instagram. Where do the roots of your ancestors' inspiration come from? Books, contemporary art, or your own own origin? Um, a lot of books. Is well, I've read so much about it now. It's hard to kind of play specific. Mm -hmm. books it's really been a journey in in understanding um just very old indigenous ideas of ancestors of, of what it is to have ancestors what what the idea of ancestors are um and at a very basic level and it's like the ant it's, it can it goes into various very deep levels so on a very surface level if i was going to tell someone a, a kind of um summary uh, a kind of level one um explanation of it it's that the, the, en the, the kind of body of knowledge and the energy and what someone, what comprises someone while they're alive doesn't just kind of disappear into the, into the ether when they are, when they're gone. So for instance, I might have a certain energy when I play or a certain attitude or a certain aptitude. Um, if you can remember, you know, when I am gone, um, if you can remember 
that energy and recall it, it can be a source of strength to you and it can actually cause you to act in a different way, to play in a different way, to, to regard your surroundings in a different way. And that is, is what a lot of traditional societies might call ancestor worship when they say that to actually harness um, the energy that people who have gone, um, you've got to do certain rites or you've got to appreciate, you know, you've got to at least think of them. So for instance, if you don't think of someone after they're gone, then they are gone. They, their energy has no place in your life. Whereas if you constantly call them forth, like let's say John Coltrane, you know, people are constantly calling him forth. People are listening to his music, thinking about his conception of sound, reading the words that he that he said. They're trying to get him into their head while, while they play, trying to understand what his vision was and, and like what his vision of sound and what his vision of interaction energy was. So that would be a form of, of worship, you know, it depends what you call worship, but that would be a, a form of reverence for his energy and his spirit. Um, and there, there are certain things you can do to, to allow a more direct um, correspondence with the source of energy that he made when he was physically here with us. Um, and that's the, the, the basic idea of it. In terms of and the, the group Shabak and the Ancestors, um, the name came from just a lot of conversations about these topics with the guys over there. Um, and obviously in South Africa, they've got a long tradition of, you know, in terms of their indigenous um, ontologies of ancestor worship and what it means to worship ancestors or to keep the energies and the ideas and the ideals of ancestors with them, you know, throughout their lives. Um, so, yeah, um, definitely not my own origin because I, I don't think that I kind of have come up with any new or novel ideas to do with ancestry. It's just a matter of reading a lot about about them in you know, in various books and then talking to people having you know lots of discussions and then just thinking about thinking about it yeah just thinking about people that have been inspiring to me and trying to um see if i can actually have their energy influence what i um what i'm doing and obviously it's like it's not it's not to do with logic you know there's nothing that i can say about this topic that has a uh a logical base that can be kind of rationally put forward is to do intuition and it's to do with what you feel and what how you allow your feelings to in to influence your um the dimension of life that is to do with the tangible okay um can you tell us a bit more about the the London jazz scene, we hear a lot of uh, of that scene in, in France. I, I don't know if it's uh, it's famous uh, in other countries, but uh, yeah, I know that uh, in France we we are all we all look at the this jazz scene. So I just want to to learn a little bit more about it. Um, it's a it's a strange it's a strange concept the London jazz scene because for me it's like what people are called the London jazz scene is a very small area of music you know like it's there's been so many scenes in in, in London you know for so for so long that you know what what you're seeing like when people say you know the London jazz scene I know what they mean um, mm -hmm. but that's like the tip of the iceberg like really because there's so many musicians here. Yeah. And, there's been so many things happening for a while. So for instance, when I was um, studying uh, in college, so that's like 2004 to 2008, you know, the big um, groups, that the big collective were like Fire Collective and the Loop Collective. And they were doing, you know, and they were kind of focused around a label called the Babel label. Uh, and I think they still got like, you can get the stuff on Bandcamp. But those are the kind of main driving forces in terms of very kind of contemporary jazz. Um, but then there were people like Brian Edwards, um, Alan Weeks that came out of the the kind of jazz Jamaica um, and the original um, jazz warriors um, group of musicians. So you've got that whole scene with, you know, like people like Orphan Robinson and Byron Wallen and, you know, say Courtney Pine and Steve Williamson that all have influenced the, the younger players that now people call the London, the, the kind of new London jazz scene. And that's not even to mention groups like say polar bear 
and Acoustic Ladyland. You know, and for me, those two groups, um, if I could, if someone were to say what two groups um, from the last 20 years signify, you know, the London jazz scene, I would say those two groups have had a, such a big impact on freeing musicians' minds in terms of what is possible. And both in terms of being, having integrity as artists, but also seeing the connection that music has to have to um, the audience. So it was the first time that I saw lots of young people really engaging with the music. When I saw like, for instance, Paul Bear or Acoustic Ladyland do their gigs, or the first time I saw performers um, that normally I would associate with the word jazz, play with an energy that I hadn't seen in the jazz scene before. You know, play with the energy that's more, um, that comes more from like the punk scene or more from the kind of hip hop scene where mm -hmm. someone is really attacking the stage. Someone's really um, going, like going deep in terms of the being dynamic, you know, physic on, a, on a whole physical level, not just on the instrument, but the whole attitude toward playing, you know. And Pete Wareham had a lot to do with that. You know, I said Roxford on the drums. Um, but if you, you know, I don't know if you want me to talk about the specific scene as it is now, you know, like in terms of the scene now, I think it's, it's great. But I, I think that, you know, a lot of the players are young and I'm not that interested in what's happening now. I'm interested in potential. And for me, the scene is great because a lot of things have potential, mm -hmm. you know. So, for instance, New Buyer just released her first album, which is a great album. But I am interested in what New Buyer does, you know, for the next five years. You know, the same with Ezra Collective, they're great. Um, but I'm interested in what happens after they've done all the touring, after they've, you know, they've done lots of sessions, you know, they've, you know, what happens when they've gone past the hype and start to really dig deep creatively, what happens on the third or fourth album, you know, and I think that's the, the, the interesting thing in the London jazz scene is that a lot of players are getting the opportunities to explore creatively, you know, and that's what happens when that kind of hype machine um, gets a hold of you. It means that actually, the, you get a chance to play as a band more, you know, because you just get more gigs. And yeah. the de artistic development, a lot of the time, is reliant on that, the, the ability to just perform more and perform to just various audiences and to see how your conception of music can be adapted to just very many, uh, you know, um, situations. You know, it was definitely the case in Sons of Kemet where, you know, our development as a band was directly related to the opportunity that we were afforded um, in doing lots of gigs all around Europe before even going to the United States. You know, it's like you become a band on the road um, and you become a band in the studio just by doing all these things. And the, the hype and the energy around the scene means that actually you've got a lot of players that are being invested in by the industry. And because I know them, I know that they have resilience and they have that kind of exploratory uh, mindset. That means that whatever they're doing now is nothing in comparison to what they'll do next year or the year after that, or you know, three, four years from now. Okay. Uh, how important do you feel your college education was? Do you feel you could have made it where you are without it? Oh, that's a that's a tough one. Um, yeah. It it depends. There's two ways of answering the question. Is is um you can answer that question in a hypothetical way. Um, do I feel that college education in general is important, and can you make it in general without it? And the answer is, um, yes, you can definitely make it that college education. Um, and I feel like the education I got as a whole was had a lot of holes in it <laughs> but mm -hmm. for me as a specific player you know in terms of my particular aptitude towards playing um it was very important you know like i said earlier you know i went to college to study the classical course because i was interested in the clarinet um and i you know the specific teacher that i had joy farrell um she plays in the britain symphonia and she was you know for me like she was the the greatest thing about Guildhall, you know, to have a lesson with her every week was, that was the highlight of my, of my whole four years there. 
you know and i feel like i would do that four years again just to have lessons with her because she is an amazing climate teacher um also being in a situation it's almost like it's a um, it's an initiation period you know where you have four years where you, it's like you sacrifice your your life towards practice and learning you know everyone doesn't do that you know some people go to music college and they they do some playing and they do some hanging out and whatever but when i was in college it was like i was playing as much as possible you know i would wake up um you could basically the practice room so you could book them for 45 minute blocks and then you had to like rebook them for like another hour you know so but from seven till ten you could practice for three hours um continuously so it's like every morning i get up do the seven to ten practice and start the day with whatever ensembles or classes i had and try to do like another two to three hours every day um so it really was a period of just doing a lot of practice you know um i had an embouchure a complete embouchure collapse in my first year because i was doing so much practice my embouchure wasn't really correct and it couldn't take the amount of playing that i was doing so then it's like if i played for like two to three minutes my embouchure would go, you know i couldn't hold the instrument in my mouth so then we had to start from scratch like really start from like grade one level going this is how you put the clarinet in your mouth <laughs> you know this is where you put your bottom lip this is how you how you do it um and if things like that you know you're just having to like build a way of technically playing the instrument from scratch um was very important um and yeah to me it's been an environment where everyone is doing that you know like um the classical department was the biggest department and it's like the, some of the plays in there were practicing all hours of every day especially the ones that came from like um like china and korea and russia you know some of those people were practicing every single hour of every day you know and for me to be in an environment like that it really just taught me that you just have to do practice you know like there's no way around it it's just like the more practice you do the better you get and if you do shit loads of practice, you'll get really good, <laughs> you know. Obviously, yeah. if you've got a conceptual backing to tell you what you should be practicing, it doesn't make sense just practicing for the sake of it. If you, and that's where the teacher comes in. So if you have a great teacher at music college that actually directs the course of your practice, you can have a really, really transformational four years where you come out of it a lot better than you went in. Um, that you can make it without it because some people are, really determined and focused um, and know what to do um, so if you can do that and you know everyone doesn't want that pressure and everyone that, that pressure doesn't work for everyone um, if you can have that focus then you don't have to go to music college um, but for me especially in that period of my life i needed that that focus um, of four years of just really um, committing myself to learning about music you know i was in the library all the time listening to as much music as I could, reading scores. Um, yeah, I didn't really go out that much. I wasn't, you know, that sociable. I was just in the practice room, in the library. Um, yeah, that's it, basically. Um, so yeah, for me, it's, it's important, but it really is what you make of it. Like college education can be nothing. You know, it can be just a waste of your time and money or it can be the most valuable period of your whole uh, of your whole career you know life you know if you take advantage of it because it is a resource you know yeah. but it's a resource that you have to open up it doesn't open up itself for you automatically okay so we have done already more than one hour so yeah maybe a last questions and uh... Uh, we have one from uh, Instagram too. What al albums could you recommend to start exploring some of the vibe you find most interesting? Mm. That's a really tough question, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, mm, I don't know. Um, it's, it's almost like I, I, the, the answer that comes into my head immediately without me thinking too much of it is just the albums that everyone says is great. You know, it's about listening to them with more depth as opposed to finding new albums that are exotic and, and new. So, for instance, mm -hmm. I love Supreme, Kind of Blue, um, Bitches Brew, uh, for instance, um, Sonny Rollins' Live at the Village Vanguard, Sam Rivers' Future Swing Song, 
um, Pat Mobley roll call, um, Charlie Parker, the album, I can't remember what, the album that's got My Song Is You and like Chi Chi and Larry Bird, I can't remember what it's called, but that one. Um, and Charlie Parker, Massey Hall, um, you know, Felonious Monk, um, what's the album Felonious Monk? Like Monk's Dream or Life at the It Club. You know, it's about getting these classic albums and trying to listen to them with more depth, you know. Or, you know, I, 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 that was obviously all the albums of a certain type of epoch, but, you know, all of them. You know, it could be Albert Eiler, it could be Cecil Taylor, it could be Anthony Braxton, just like all the, the big, you know, the albums that you think define an artist, you know, and, you know, and that might be down to personal taste, but it's about trusting your, 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 your taste in music also, listening to them with more depth. Um, so that's, it's like, I, for me, it's like, I, I might find a vibe that I then um, carry and, and develop from something that everyone listens to. It's about hearing, hearing things that people aren't hearing, you know, or hearing things in a new way, rather than mm -hmm. hearing new things in an old way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but then obviously, and that's just jazz, it's like, you know, there's, there's other, other genres of music, you know, actually, probably also, um, there's an album by Count Ossie and the Mystic Revelation of Rastafari that was pretty seminal to me as well, called Ground Nation. Um, and the saxophone player on that is a player called Cedric M. Brooks, um, who's a you know great um, Jamaican saxophone player. Uh, also, uh, uh, Ethiopian saxophone player Getachew, Getachew uh, Macoria. Um, he's got an album, I can't remember its name, but uh, I think Negus of Sax or something like that. Uh, but yeah, that was also you know very influential. Um, yeah, just, just the good albums. Just listen more deeply. Basically, it's like you know, like for me, it's like I might go back to albums like you know Coltrane at Live at the Village Vanguard and literally hear new stuff. You know, mm. like it's like the the further I get in in the development of my own personal conception of music, the more I'm able to hear into the conception of other artists. You know. And for me, if you, it's about going forward and going back and realizing that actually what was behind was actually maybe further ahead than you thought, you know. And, it's, you know, and that's also, you know, if you're looking at um, indigenous conceptions or African conceptions of the circularity of time, it's that, you know, time doesn't necessarily operate within a linear construct. It's not that you start in the, it's not that the past starts and then that past goes to the present and the present goes to the future and then the future goes to the end, full stop, is that things go around in cycles. So the only way you're gonna go forward is to, to, to go back and see what the future holds within the past, you know? So I might go back to the Armstrong record and try to really listen, or Lester Young, listen deeply into what he's doing. And I might hear some stuff that I go, oh my God, I can't believe I'm hearing this, you know. I did that recently with a Louis Armstrong record. He's got a tune called um, Weatherbird, I think it is, with Earl Hines. Um, this, I think it's a duo. Um, and there's a moment in there, in just in the middle of that tune, where they do something rhythmically that is so advanced. And it just happens within a couple of seconds that when I kind of caught it, I was just like, oh my God, like, this is a, incredible. And it's something that, I really hadn't heard before and that I could have just missed if I wasn't listening deeply. But like the deeper I listen, the more I hear stuff that actually makes me dream about what I can do in the future, you know? Okay. Thank you very much. Do you have some news to share before we leave? Um, new project, new things going on? There, there's a new Santa Kemet album. Um, it should be announced imminently, but it should be out, uh, I think, the end of April. I think it had to be delayed nice. a little bit. But yeah, there's okay. a new Santa Kemet album coming out. Um, I think it's a it's a, a great album. I you know, and obviously I'm I'm biased because you know can I like made the album, but I I really it's like when I when I like the albums that I make, I listen to them all the time. And I listen to the album every day, um, just for my own personal gratification. Um, I, I really love it. I, you know, I, yeah, I, I know it probably sounds really egotistical, but I, I, I really love the album. It's like, it's probably my, the album that I've put the most personal input into 
the construction of it. Obviously, the, the, the album was made by a band as a communal, uh, in a communal setting. But last year, being in lockdown, you know, I was able to take the, the information that the band recorded and really go into it in terms of structuring a journey from start to end. Like, you know, that's the, the whole thing with an album. It's not a collection of tunes. It's, mm-hmm. uh, it's a document that has a beginning and an ending. And actually the weird thing is that it goes, I see it going from both ends into the middle. Um, but that's a whole other thing. But yeah, the, the Sunday Kemet album should be really good. The Comet coming, we started the kind of production of that next album. So that should hopefully be in 2022. Um, and then, yeah, I'm just kind of working on this book um, and starting a, an album of my own, a kind of Shibaka Hutchings album, um, cool. or starting experiments. You know, it's like I, a lot of times I'll, it's like I don't like to form or name specific things that I'm doing before the time is right. So I don't even want to say I am doing a particular thing, but I'm starting experiments that will hopefully lead in the Shibaka Hutchings album for 2023 you know hopefully uh, so we see where that goes well a lot of uh, a lot of things going on that's nice i'm looking forward to to listen to those uh, new albums yeah i mean that and the crushing inertia of lockdown <laughs> staying in yeah <laughs> Yeah, we hope to to be able to to see love music soon too because uh, yeah it it's nice to to go out and hear some music yeah yeah hopefully there'll be live gigs but if there isn't then you know we just have to keep our tension and anxiety um with us until the live music comes and it'll just be even better you know for me the longer yeah. we wait until we have live music the better the feeling is going to be when we do have it even if we've got to wait for another like two years before we can tour it just means that when that tour happens is it really going to be the best tour anyone has ever experienced like, yeah, I, I really think that, you know, all of the disruption to our kind of um, performing life is made up by the fact that when gigs do happen, it's going to be such an epic, like, re- com- you know, reconvergence of the, that energy that flows between the audience and the performer. That is going to all make sense. You know, it's almost like we needed this break to appreciate what we had, mm-hmm. you know, to be able to dance together and to be able to actually you know, be in a space, you know, and that situation of being in a confined space might not happen for many years, but I just hope it happens in my lifetime. Yeah. I hope that, you know, there is, there is a point in it and probably with all the vaccinations, it'll probably happen pretty soon. I'm probably being very dramatic, but as long as it can happen within the time that I can still play and I'm still able to, you know, then I think it's going to be worth it. Yeah, I hope so. Can you, play a little uh, bass clarinet before we leave or yeah Do you, yeah i'd love to hear you Thank <laughs> you. 
Nice, thank you. Thank you very much, Shabaka, for being here. It was a really, really nice talk, really inspiring. I think uh, like a lot of people like really uh, say really? that. Uh, yeah, it was uh, a real pleasure to have you tonight. And uh, uh, yeah, I, I hope you have a, a good night. And uh, yeah, I hope we can, uh, f I guess, first hear your new album and then see you live soon. And that oh, would be you. great. That would be great. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for having me. And um, yeah, what we can do uh, again soon. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, thank you all for being here. Thanks, everyone. And uh, bye bye. See you soon. Bye.